Coming up, finances for tribal projects get a boost across the country. We learn about the Crows Plenty Doors Community Development Corporation. Plus, an educator in Maine is helping spread Wabanaki culture and history in the state's schools. And tribal leaders are in Washington, D.C. this week for various committee hearings. Holly cook Macaro tells us which ones. I'm Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start on the north slope of Alaska, where a decision is soon expected on the controversial Willow Project. The company ConocoPhillips Alaska is asking the federal government for five permits to drill for oil. The permit would also authorize the construction of roads, pipelines, and several bridges to accomplish the drilling. Currently, the north slope is the country's most undisturbed swath of land. While prominent Alaska Native leaders support the approval of the project, including Alaska Representative Mary Peltola, not everyone is in agreement. Climate activists and environmental groups have advocated against the Willow Project, saying that the environmental impact of it would be devastating. The Biden administration said it would support a scaled-back version of the project, and it is expected the Bureau of Land Management is likely to approve three of the five sites. It is one of the largest native art markets in the world. The Heard Museum opened its doors this weekend in Arizona to its annual fair and market. ICT's Daniel Herrera has this report. A giant reunion. That was an overwhelming feeling from the 65th annual Heard Market in Phoenix, Arizona. Kathleen Wall, an artist based out of New Mexico, she's world renowned for creating storytellers. Wall says this event means a lot to her. I think my friends, family, um, reconnecting, um, you know, a lot of these clients that have, I've um, obtained over all these years have become good friends of mine. So these are um, not only chances to sell our work, but they're almost like reunions. Now the herd market attracts thousands gathered here annually. Artists sell jewelry, textiles, paintings, and pottery. Kara Lujan is a vendor who makes glass and clay sculptures. Like Wall, she traveled over 450 miles from New Mexico. Being able to show my work and see other people, that other artists that I know, it's, it's like a nice community of Native artists. The Heard Museum also gives Best of Show Awards, which makes this a competition of sorts for artists to be recognized for their efforts. That's part of what brings award-winning artist Frank Fowler Jr. back year after year. Hey, I paint a Navajo traditional art. I paint themes like landscapes back home around uh, Kaibito area, Kaibito, Arizona, Kaibat country. And um, the reason why I really paint the uh, Navajo call trees. I tried to preserve the culture of the Navajo. In Phoenix, Arizona, Daniel Herrera, ICT News. Well, alarm bells are sounding after 23 whales have been found dead in a matter of a few months. The whales washed ashore along the East Coast with over a dozen of them found within New York and New Jersey alone since December. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the fatalities of the largely humpback whales happened after they were struck by ships. 
Scientists say climate change could be to blame. That's in addition to an increase in cargo shipments at busy ports and shipping channels. Despite minimal tribal collaboration on this issue, Chief of the Uncachag Nation Harry Wallace conducted a burial service for the latest whale that washed ashore on Lido Beach last month. In a statement, Wallace said a sacred burial honors the relationship between whales and local indigenous communities. Investigations to find the definitive causes of death are underway by local governments. Last week, New Jersey politicians called for a moratorium on offshore wind energy projects to decrease shipping traffic while this issue is being examined. Sydney, Australia is the center of major buzz as the international LGBTQ community celebrates World Pride. The first event of its kind started more than two decades ago in Rome, Italy. This year is the first time the event is being held in Australia. It is expected to be Sydney's biggest event since the, the 2000 Olympics. A major highlight of World Pride is the Missed First Nations Supreme Queen pageant, which is Australia's largest indigenous drag circuit. The three-week festival is expected to have 500,000 visitors attending the over 300 events put on by organizers. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. After 25 years with the Indian Health Service as a public health nutritionist, Charlene Johnson saw the connection between poverty and physical health. She now leads Plenty Doors, which is a community development financial institution. Welcome, Charlene, and happy International Women's Day to you. Thank you. Hello, Aliyah. Thanks for having me. Let's start with an overview of CDFIs. What are they? So community um, development financial institutions are <clears throat> financial institutions that target um, those uh, communities and individuals who are um, unable to access capital and access um, typical the regular banking institutions. And so this, we like to say that um, CDFIs are banking with a heart or with compassion. You're actually a healthcare professional. What prompted you to make the career shift into finance? Well, if you've ever heard of social determinants of health. So when I was in healthcare, um, you thought healthcare was um, connected with access to healthcare, but your health is actually influenced by much more than just the health care that you have access to. It's the environment that you live in. And um, there's institutions or organizations that have put out what social determinants of health are. And that includes access to health care, but it's also education, the economy that you live in, the infrastructure. And so because looking around in my community, the one thing that was lacking in our community was a good, stable economy. And so by going into finance, by going into efforts to improve our local economy, that's one way that I can still impact the health, health of our people. And actually tell us more about Plenty Doors and what your mission is. So um, Plenty Doors, we started Plenty Doors in 2018. And the mission of Plenty Doors is um, to improve the community through economic development, individual and community capacity building, business development, promotion uh, and preservation of our culture, environment and food sovereignty. And actually tell us a little bit maybe about the people that you work with or the um, tribes that you work with. So currently we primarily focus on the Absaliga Nation or the Crow Tribe and um, and we work with anyone who lives in our uh, communities in our region. And I understand you actually have a, a working relationship with a Little Bighorn College. Tell us about that. So we, um, so in our mission, we talk about capacity building from an individual and a community standpoint. 
And I feel that our part, we've had a strong partnership with Little Big Horn College in the area of workforce development. So we have worked together to expand their current trades programs. So to include electrical, plumbing, carpentry, and HVAC. And when you look at our community, we um, have inadequate housing, just like every place else, but the housing that does exist is dilapidated. And so one way that we thought that we could build capacity in our community is to train up our young people to do that work. Because currently we have to rely on um, businesses that are outside of our reservation and sometimes 50 miles away. And oftentimes they refuse to come down to the reservation to provide that service. And so if we can build our own people, um, train our own people to do that work, we won't have to rely on outside communities for those types of services. May provide some context for us in terms of how many other CDFIs there are across the nation and um, how you work with other CDFIs. So currently, as far as native CDFIs, um, there's um, over 60 native CDFIs. Um, Plenty Doors is part of a coalition that consists of nine CDFIs. And we recently, um, uh, the coalition has been awarded a $45 million grant from the EDA Build Back Better Regional Challenge grant. And so with that grant, um, our efforts are to build um, the indigenous finance industry. So we're looking at building our capacity. We're looking at ways that we can um, um, support our workforce. Um, for my particular project, it's to build um, a building, two buildings actually, and the buildings will um, house plenty doors and it'll also incubate businesses. Uh, we also have a re revolving loan fund um, that each of the nine CDFIs will have access to, and this will allow us to offer um, lending capital to small businesses in our communities. I want to end here. I mentioned earlier that it is International Women's Day. Um, for other women who work in this line of work, um, you know, what do you have to say to them and to other female tribal leaders, um, you know, on this day and moving forward, of course? Well, I think um, women, uh, Native women leaders are natural leaders. We're caregivers. And um, the one thing that I would say to um, women out there is to make sure you take care of yourself and to support each other. Well, Charlene, thank you so much. Thank you. A 2001 state law in Maine requires K through 12 schools to teach Wabanaki history and culture. More than 20 years later, some say the law has still not been fully implemented. The College of Education at the University of Maine has stepped in to help with two new initiatives aimed at better preparing teachers to teach Wabanaki studies. John Bear Mitchell from the university's Wabanaki Center spearheaded the effort, and he joins us now virtually. Welcome, John. Thank you. What are the two new initiatives that you're currently working on at the University of Maine? So the first initiative that I kind of worked on and it's done now and it's actually out there for the consumer is I made a micro credential for people to take, which is about six hours long called Dawnland because the word Wabanaki means people of the first light or people of Dawnland. We see the sun first here on the East coast. So it's a micro credential that's anybody's able to take. And after five and a half hours, we'll know nothing about Wabanaki tribes of Maine and then come out of that on the other end, completely sort of knowledgeable about who we are and our status within the state. And they're able to then uh, pursue further type of learning if they decide to. So that is there. And I also am teaching for the first time in my 20 plus years of being at the university here, a course called Teaching Wabanaki Studies, which is a advanced topic course, a 400 level course that uh, pre-service teachers, students here at the University of Maine, whether you're undergrad or graduate can take to able to be able to start to gather some resources to know what's out there and to practice sort of making some programs. So those are the two initiatives that we're working on at the moment. 
I imagine when you're developing this curriculum, there is so much to, cho to choose from. Tell us how you sort of develop these or what your work process looks like in, in terms of what actually goes into this curriculum. So I actually went back and we have Ice Age archeology span that's been done in this land. And we also have stories about living on top of ice in this area. So I broke it up into four modules through both the initiatives that we're working on. And we start with the Ice Age period and the kind of environment that was created here. And then after the ice went out with the tundra being left behind by these glaciers, how people navigated the land. So we go from Ice Age to pre-contact and then another module to contact and then modern day issues and events with a lot of um, extra academic readings if the learners decide to use them. I opened up this segment with, of course, stating that this all came from a 2001 state law. Maybe reflect on how well or how not well you think that this law is working. I think it was a good start. LD 291 in 2001, which was the act to create you know, Wabanaki studies and Maine Indian studies in all the schools in the state of Maine, was a good start. We had no content that the schools were required to teach, and now we have 54 content areas within the state of Maine learning standards. But that's only in one subject. That's in history, social studies, civics, sort of that arena. And so right now, before the legislature in the state of Maine, we have a law called LD 1566, which to, is to expand this into all subjects, and that hopefully we can bridge a better sort of uh, understanding about who we are. Because I think the main point of this is to take people's questions, fears, anxieties about who we are away from them by just teaching them who we really are from our perspective. If this uh, state law has been in effect now for 20 years, I imagine that you're actually seeing students who are now in uh, college or who have gone through this kind of program. Are you seeing any kinds of, I guess what you would call success stories in terms of those students better understanding the indigenous people of Maine? Maine is broken up into several different school districts that are locally run. It's no state mandate for curriculum. It's local mandates for curriculum. So some school districts have done excellent exemplary work in those fields and in that area. And students do come out with a good understanding. They're, they're saying words that, uh, you know, we want them to hear. Wabanaki, what does it mean? Who are the tribes of Maine? You know, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq, and the Maliseet. And, and uh, what's the history? What's the prehistory? They're coming out talking about some of our chiefs. That's a good start. And I think that you know, we can always improve. You know, if we look at U.S. history, we're required to take that course, you know, U.S. history from middle school, high school, all the way into college. It's a mandate. It's a requirement where our history is an elective. And because of that, I want to make sure that whoever does take this, whoever comes and wants to continue their learning in it, has the proper tools. We only have a short time left here, but I do want to talk about what else you have going um, on at the university, university's Wabanaki Center. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of different things. We have the Wabanaki Leadership Institute, where we're training up and coming leaders throughout the communities of the Wabanaki tribes, even into the Canadian Maritimes, where we expand, of course, the border across us, we didn't cross it. And um, we also have a uh, Wabanaki Youth and Science program here, where we're taking Western trained scientists and pairing them with indigenous uh, elders who have that same knowledge and they're working together with our youth. And, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff like that. We're really trying to reach out and we're really making things happen. And that's what it's all about for us is to network and make these things uh, available to the community. Well, John Bear Mitchell from the University of Maine, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Tribal leaders are on hand at the U.S. Capitol this week. That's for a number of hearings on various committees in the U.S. House and Senate. ICT regular contributor Holly cook Macaro is following all of these events closely and joins us once again. Hi, Holly. Hi, Leah. It's good to see you. Holly, I understand the Tribal Leader Testimony Days kicks off today. Tell us what that is. So today in the House uh, Interior Subcommittee on Appropriations, it is um, <clears throat> this week, there's two days, 
of tribal leader testimony. And this is uh, something we normally see at the beginning of each new Congress, and we are at the beginning of the 118th Congress. And uh, tribal leaders come in and provide testimony um, on individual needs for their reservations. And we also see testimony from the national orgs as well about their priorities, their needs, and um, and the the funding that they're going to need in this year's appropriations bill. That these these two days are critically important. Um, both it kind of gets gets all the tribal leaders organized, ready for the lay of the land for upcoming appropriation request deadlines. But we will see members of the. Um, the leadership in particular will sit through um, both of these days and then membership from the appropriations subcommittees, which is made up of seven Republicans and four Democrats. It is, um, um, which kind of reflects the makeup of the House. I thought it would be a little bit more of an even split, but it is not. But it is valuable for the members and their staffs because they hear directly from tribal leadership about what the spending priorities, the funding needs are for Indian country as we go into this um, appropriations season. We know that at this point, it would be nearly impossible to hear from every tribal nation across the country at these hearings. Um, but so far, which tribal nations will be present um, to give that testimony? Well, I, I know there are, there are um, my own tribe I, um, is, is there, the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe from Northern Minnesota, um, along with representatives from all across the country. And in addition, um, the, the national orgs, NCAI will provide testimony. I know Executive Director Larry Wright is there today. Um, we will see testimony from the National Indian Education Association, the National Indian Child Welfare Association. So in addition to the tribal leadership, we will see, um, they, they kind of go, just shuffle them through a whole day long in, um, in 10 minute increments. So we will, we will see a, just a rotating schedule on, on two days of testimony from tribal leaders in, in, um, today and tomorrow. A separate committee, the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, of course, is holding a hearing on Wednesday today as well. Um, tell us what you know so far about that. And this again is a is a traditional hearing that we see at the beginning of a new Congress. And so the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, led by Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii, and um, the vice chair is Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. And interesting on her title, um, I'm not sure if most most of Indian country knows this, but the ranking member or the most senior member from the from the minority party in the Senate is usually called the ranking member on all the other committees. But in, a, in recognition of the bipartisan nature of, of Indian affairs and Indian issues in the United States Senate, the, the ranking member is called the vice chair. So Lisa Murkowski is called the vice chair of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. I think that tradition was started in the 90s by um, the late and great former chairman, Senator Inouye, also, also from Hawaii. So today we will hear um, from seven witnesses and uh, again, NCI is there, Treasurer um, President Holsey from the Stockbridge Muncie Nation is representing NCAI. We will see Rico Frias from the National Association um, of Finance Officers, NAFOA. And um, we've got the American Indian Housing Council. We have the Intertribal Ag Council. And um, who am I missing? So we've got um, all of those will outline the priorities which are reflected uh, from the input of the, the membership. Uh, we have the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the Alaska Federation of Natives. So that will make up the, the witness list for today's hearing in the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, which you can either watch live at indian.senate.gov or they always post it um, usually by the end of the day or, or the next morning as well. I always find it fascinating to hear what Indian country expects um, to, expects from the Senate on, in terms of action. And um, and then ongoing priorities uh, that that I think we will all be hearing more about as the 118th Congress gets underway. I do want to squeeze another uh, committee in here, uh, the House Natural Resources Committee. Um, what kinds of traction or what kinds of uh, hearings have you have you been hearing about there? Well, today they it's been a slower start in the House, given some of the drama, you know, with the leadership elections and getting getting. Um, getting organized in terms of committee membership, committee chairs, all of those things. But they are underway, they're set, hearings are beginning and uh, and being held regularly. We've seen a couple already. Today we have a hearing the Federal Land Subcommittee that I think will be of interest 
to tribes in terms of uh, conservation priorities on public lands. I also know that Chairman Grijalva, or now he's the ranking member, the former chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, um, Raul Grijalva from, from Arizona, has been very active in putting out there uh, what his priorities are um, for, for kind of in response or um, in preparation for some of the Republican initiatives they expect to see coming out of, of um, the, the Natural Resources Committee. So they're pre preparing to reintroduce legislation um, for Indian country. I expect that that means we will see a reintroduction of the RESPECT Act, which was a priority for ranking member Grijalva in the last Congress, but hit some bumps in the road and didn't make it through uh, in spite of a lot of effort. So I also um, know that the Republicans are, are going to be releasing an energy package. There will be concerns um, about the, the giveaways and how tribes are treated within that. There's also, as you noted earlier, a lot of activism right now around the Willow Project. And uh, I, I expect we'll, we will be hearing and seeing some of that as well. Well, ICT regular contributor Holly cook Macaro, thank you as always. Yes, thank you, Leah. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.